All right, you think we can get started? Yeah. Good, fabulous morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Brittany Duggar from the University of California, Davis, and it is an awesome Monday today. We get to start off. Appreciate everyone's patience and attendance. I know everyone has like a million things probably they have to attend, but you're stopping by today to listen to some three great presenters who had recent papers on the digital pathology realm. We have Dr. Coughlin from the University of California, San Diego. We have Dr. Kurt Farrell from Mount Sinai, and we have Dr. Shinshuki Koga from Mayo Clinic currently, but Tuesday he'll be part of Penn. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to give it over to these three presenters. Uh, but before I do, one thing, if you guys have a great paper that you'd like to present, please contact us, right? We want to continue these things going and kind of promote a lot of these realms with digital pathology as well as machine learning. So just given that nice little uh, public service announcement, and without further ado, I'm going to turn off my video and give it up to these three great presenters. All right, so I'm going to be up first. So let me just give a second to share my screen here. All right, wonderful. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for attending uh, this webinar. My name, again, is Dr. David Coughlin. I am an assistant professor over here at the University of California, San Diego. I am a movement disorders neurologist who also does research in translational neuropathology. And we wanted to get together this webinar to highlight these recent papers. Um, and they are chosen fairly intentionally to sort of highlight some of the interesting opportunities and uh, potentials for advancement within digital pathology. And um, let me just get started here. There we go. Okay, so I do not have any uh, disclosures that are relevant to this talk, and here is my funding information. And these are the three articles that we're going to go over today with our wonderful illustrious presenters being bolded here. In case you need these for references later on so you can read them in depth. So I wanted to just do some quick introductions about digital pathologies and the large opportunities for development and advancement that this affords to us in the research realm. Um, so to kind of compare and contrast, you know, traditional neuropathologic assessments, H&E, immunohistochemistry, and other chemical stains have really been very well accepted and recognized methods over many, many decades at this point. And in a handful of studies that have been done comparing interrelator reliability, we tend to see moderate to good levels of interrelator reliability across expert neuropathologists. There are some drawbacks to these types of approaches. One is that they're inherently subjective, and those interrelator reliability numbers sometimes are you know, more moderate than good, unfortunately. And unfortunately, it also yields these fairly coarse measures of neuropathologic severity. You know, you get sort of a diagnosis, and sometimes you get these ordinal grading scales, you know, Brock staging one through six, or CIRAD zero through three, et cetera, or regional uh, density pathology scores where you get some mild, moderate, or severe. And at the end of this, this is fairly, you know, coarse data that may be a little bit difficult to do more sophisticated statistical modeling with. And ultimately, there is some site-to-site -site variability. You know, different uh, pathology labs may do slightly different sampling and process their tissue in slightly different fashions and use different uh, stains and, and antibodies to really do their assessments. And if you guys are interested in learning a little bit more about the current state of the ADRCs, this working group did publish a paper, a survey paper based on uh, gathering some of the methods from all the uh, ADRCs uh, who... Um, submitted data anyway, and you basically saw that there was a, some degree of variability in how people were doing their neuropathologic assessments. Now, digital pathology assessments, there are some pros here as well, and this is the, the basic workflow for digital pathology work on the bottom here where you do your immunohistochemical staining. The slide undergoes high-resolution scanning. People have to select uh, a region of interest to annotate and, and assess, and then these images undergo some type of quantification using different types of software anyway. And this gives you a much more finely granulated assessment of the pathologic severity that might be there, and that allows for more objective measurements. And another really great thing about it is it makes a consumable resource, you know, tissue that you have to cut and stain, a sort of more enduring resource where you have an image at that point uh, that you can transfer and do various different types of computations on. Um, there are some drawbacks or at least challenges to consider. One, there's a fair amount of infrastructure that's required to do digital pathology, including 
Uh, you have to have access to a slide scanner and then have to deal with some fairly large image files afterwards and image storage. Um, and ultimately, there are many, many different methods out there for how people do digital pathology assessments. You know, these different slide scanners, they give you different file types, they're scanned at different resolutions. Ultimately, there are many different software packages that are out there that give you the ability to do these types of assessments, but there's not like much in the way of agreed upon methodologies across sites anyway. And at, the, at its core, you are potentially doing different, um, different analysis methods, maybe the total signal, which is something that we're going to talk about, versus feature detection and machine learning, which Drs. Koga and Farrell are going to talk about here today. And then one other big question is scalability. So a lot of these projects so far are single center because you can rely on a single site where the people are using the same sampling methods, the same tissue fixation, the same staining, et cetera. But ideally we'd love to figure out if this is possible to scale up, if we can do the experiments necessary to feel like we can actually gather metrics that are gonna be comparable across sites or that even we could gather digital pathology assessments in a prospective fashion as our brain banks grow and we can add more cases to different data sets instead of having to go back, cut, stain, and analyze large sections to answer research questions as we come up with them. So it was really one of the, those latter questions that was the inspiration for this project that we started um, as a collaborative work between University of California, San Diego, and the University of Pennsylvania. And this is our paper using this digital histology studies to assess gray and white matter tau burdens across the spectrum of tauopathies. And what we did is we collected cases again from UCSD and UPenn, and we collected cases who had classical amnestic Alzheimer's disease, who had uh, immediate, sorry, intermediate or high degrees of AD neuropathologic change um, at autopsy. We also collected some Lewy body disease cases who had PDD or DLB. Uh, who also had concomitant intermediate or high degrees of Brock tau pathology at autopsy. We also collected PSP and CBD cases. And in those four R tauopathies, we did uh, intentionally try to take cases who had very, very low levels um, of AD neuropathologic change. So the relatively pure four R tauopathy cases of PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy, and CBD, cortical basal degeneration. So this was the set of the cases that we were able to collect to fit those criteria. There was 150 cases in total that we analyzed. Um, and despite the fact that they're from two centers and different diseases, they're actually fairly well matched as far as disease duration and age of death with the CBD cases and PSP cases with a slightly uh, shorter disease duration. Um, a little bit more men in the Lewy body group than some of the other ones too, which is reflective of the uh, male predominance in, in Lewy body diseases. Um, so we took sections from the middle frontal cortex, superior temporal cortex, and the angular gyrus. And we initially selected these regions because they were the most um, consistently collected across both of our centers uh, when we were looking back at the tissue that was available for the analysis. And we used very, very similar immunohistochemical methods between the two sites. Um, at, we were using the AT8 uh, antibody to stand for phosphorylated tau, with the particular conditions being optimized at each site individually. But otherwise, we used the same commercially available reagents um, for our anti-mouse secondary, the AB kit and the diaminobenzamide chromogen. We had different slide scanners. Um, at UPenn, it was a lamina. Um, and at UCSD, it was a Zeiss Axio scan that was used to scan the slides. And we were using this um, with QPath was the software that we were using to analyze these sections. And that's the version that we used also. And we were tuning the red, blue, green color vectors and optical density threshold using five slides per staining run. This is all to say that we were trying to be very tightly controlled with the immunohistochemical methods that we used across the different sites here. And I did want to just give you a couple of screenshots just to kind of show like how this looks and so it's, it's easier to see than to talk about sometimes, but this is what the uh, QPath terminal will look like. And what I've done here just for you guys anyway, is this is a, um, a, a hippocampal slice we're up in the transentorhinal cortex, it looks like. Uh, and I selected a, a region so that we could actually do some red, blue, green color vector tuning. So the box in the back is the annotation. It has a little bit of... Uh, 
neurofibrillary tangle pathology. So it's going to detect your brown pathology. There's a little bit of blue from the hematoxylin in there. And then there's a little bit of background uh, so we can figure this out. And then this visual stain editor has a built-in program that will help us tune the red, blue, green color vectors to say, hey, I want computer, I want you to get exactly this shade of brown. That's this mix of these colors anyway. So after you figure out what the appropriate color gradient is going to be for your given staining run, this is an example of us taking a region of interest, a gray matter section um, from that same slide anyway, and we create these two parallel lines and it creates this tiling pattern where it makes these 175 micrometer squared boxes with a 70% dropout. And you might ask why, why are you uh, dropping out tiles and stuff? And, and the idea is actually because there are these different layer tropisms where certain neuropathologies like to live at certain uh, levels anyway. And you can even see that with your naked eye here, how the neurofibrillary tangle uh, pathology likes to be in certain levels of the cortex here. And this dropout uh, algorithm uh, helps uh, lessen the bias that might happen with different types of angles of cuts in the way. And this is based on some work that we had done uh, many years ago with the citation below with some of the original validation work. If you zoom in, this is when you do the thresholding and you can see that the algorithm will pick up uh, the burden of tau pathology. Here are some representative images with the 3R4R uh, neurofibrillary tangle pathology in the top row, and then it's a tufted astrocyte and astrocytic plaque from the PSP and CBD cases below with the digital detection algorithms overlaid there as well. And the first thing that we do after we gather these um, annotations and this percent area occupied um, values, we go back and we uh, compare it to blinded ordinal scores. You know, we basically give the slides to our pathologists and say, hey, do you think that this is a mild, moderate, or severely affected brain region and compare it to the percent area occupied numbers? And you see this very robust stepwise increase um, across both centers. And this is kind of one of the bigger, meatier uh, slides for the presentation anyway, but this is basically the, uh, the values for everything that we were able to collect from these cases. The gray matter annotations are in the top row and the white matter annotations are in the bottom row with UPenn at the left and UCSD at the right. And what we tended to see was that in the Alzheimer's group, the superior temporal cortex harbor the highest amount of tau pathology. Uh, followed by the angular gyrus, uh, and then frontal lobe was usually the lowest, and that was the same pattern that we observed in the Lewy body disease cases. And when you went over to the four-hour tauopathies in PSP, um, we saw a, a more even spread of neocortical pathology in both the gray matter and the white matter, um, although, you know, proportionally, white matter is more heavily hit in the PSP cases. And in the CBD cases, you saw very high degrees of both gray matter and white matter pathology, also more evenly spread in general. Um, the heat map on the left shows the same data, just in a color gradient. And I think it also helps to highlight the relative uh, differences between the gray matter and the white matter tau burdens that we are measuring here. Um, and because of that, we then calculated a white matter to gray matter tau ratio and compared those ratios across the different disease states. And again, we saw very, very reliable increases in uh, the relationship between gray and white matter tau pathology with uh, Alzheimer's disease having the lowest ratio and uh, CBD having really the highest ratio. And um, I think if you wanted to conceptualize this, this little uh, chart that's on the bottom is really why the ratios uh, bear out that way across the different diseases. And then lastly, if you look at the relationship between gray matter and white matter pathology, you know, you see these, all of these uh, correlations are highly significant, but the slopes of these lines are different, where the for our tauopathies, the PSP and the CBD guys have a steeper slope, which basically is saying to us that for every unit of gray matter tau pathology that's added, there's a correspondingly higher amount of white matter pathology that's associated with that for a given region in a case anyway. So we thought that that was interesting. So from this study, what we felt was that that 
we were very encouraged. We felt like the digital histology measurements were recapitulating these features that are well described in traditional uh, neuropathologic literature. You know, within the AD realm and the 3R, 4R telopathies, we were seeing that, again, the temporal lobe really harbored the highest degree of gray matter pathology, which is an expected pattern. And we also were seeing in our four hour tauopathies that the white matter at a proportionally much higher degree of tau burden uh, than gray matter. And that's also like a very good thing to be able to see through the digital realm, even though it's been described before. But this also added a great deal more granularity. And even within this, you, you could see like a spectrum of disease burden, which allowed for this different types of statistical modeling. You know, we were able to do these linear regression um, matrices and everything to really see the associations between gray matter and white matter pathology. And that's something that you just wouldn't be able to do necessarily um, if you're using traditional pathologic methods anyway. And I guess like how could this particular data set be useful in the future for things other than digital pathology? I mean, I think that's probably most useful for imaging pathological correlates. And when people are trying to design different types of tau pet tracers and trying to understand how um, different patterns of pet uptake might relate to neuropathology anyway, I think using this type of approach gives you that extra granularity to understand, you know, where some of this tau burden may be and how much it may be. Um, between cases and between diseases. And I guess lastly, in some ways, most importantly, we saw really, really similar results in the two independent cohorts from two different brain banks. Um, and that was really good to see and suggested that maybe some scalability may be appropriate in the future. But I did want to talk about limitations. Um, we didn't do all of the validation steps that would have been necessary to really feel good about combining cohorts. Like we weren't sure if we could really put the UPIN and the UCSD tissue together in a single data set, so we kept them separate for this project. And we were encouraged that we were seeing extremely similar results anyway, and uh, percent area occupied of tau burdens that were very similar. Um, but we did use really, really similar methods. Um, you know, we were using the same antibodies. There's certainly different fixation and processing um, things between our different centers, but we we're using very similar immunohistochemical approaches and using the same you know, software package and, and digital pathology approach. But I think if we we're going to scale further, there would still be concerns if we we're going across different sites where maybe the methods were a little bit more disparate. Um, at its heart, you know, the percent area occupied number that we're reporting here as our primary outcome variable is a pan tau detection method. And it's not differentiating between different tau features like neurofibrillary tangles versus neuritic plaques. And that's actually why we're going to talk to Dr. Koga right now because their machine learning algorithm does tell different tau features apart anyway. And I think that it's kind of interesting to jump from from this paper to Dr. Koga and Farrell's paper, because this type of machine learning and feature detection may be able to overcome some of these concerns, not just in sort of teasing apart the different neuropathologic features that you might see on a slide, but potentially also to be able to overcome some of the concerns about run-to-run -run variability and some of the differences that we see across our centers anyway. Um, for what it's worth, uh, though, we have done some, like, validation work at our own center in, in our own lab anyway to see how much variation there is from staining run to staining run and at least within our own lab and in our own institution even if you do manual staining or automated staining using like a ventana auto stainer on serial sections we see really really high correlations in our digital pathology measure anyway so I think that it seems like it's probably quite likely personally that within a certain center, if you're using the same types of methods, you will be able to use digital pathology stuff um, to assess pathologic burden in a prospective fashion anyway. But the machine learning thing might actually help us get over the hump to be able to start combining cohorts across centers anyway. And probably with that, I'm going to be happy to turn it over to Dr. Koga, who's going to talk a little bit more about their machine learning um, work that really helps tease out these different tau features um, in, in a variety of tauopathies and even mixed cases too, which I think is very exciting. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and let him go. Thank you.
Okay, so may I start my presentation? And can you see my presentation? Yes, to both. Okay, so good morning, everyone. I'm Shunsuke Koga from Mayo Clinic. And yeah, I'm honored to present my research here today. In this presentation, I'm going to review some of my, our machine learning based models to assist the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and tau pathies. And no disclosure. So as you have already known, tau pathies is a major entity of neurodegenerative disorders. For example, Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia and characterized by extracellular accumulation of amyloid beta and intracellular accumulation of tau proteins. Patients with PSP and CBD present with both cognitive and motor symptoms and pathologically characterized by the accumulation of tau in both neurons and glia. Other tau pathies include PICS disease, GGT, and others. So currently, the di definite diagnosis of these disorders requires neuropathological assessment at autopsy, including tau immunohistochemistry. And this process requires skilled pathologists and can be quite time consuming, so which makes it hard to use on a large scale. So now many physicians and scientists have been interested in artificial intelligence or AI in clinical practice and research. As presented here today, uh, several exciting progress has been made in the field of neuropathology. And actually this slide shows a part of the publication. And using the data set of histopathology data slide images, these AI systems have been trained to analyze and categorize images, much like a pathologist might examine a slide. So in the Mayo Clinic, we have developed several machine learning models using histopathology images of tau pathies. This is the first model, and uh, this is a very simple image classification model for three types of tau pathologies. A tufted astrocytes in PSP and astrocytic plaque in CBD and neurotic plaques in AD. And this type of image classification was too easy to the AI and the accuracy was 98 to 100% of each pathology. And we next to we next uh, make a different model called object detection model using YOLO v3 algorithm. And in this algorithm, uh, this can identify or recognize five different tau pathologies like neuronal inclusions and neurotic plaque, tufted astrocyte, astrocytic plaque, and cold bodies. And this algorithm can recognize and count each pathology in, uh, in a region of interest. And for example, uh, we use three different uh, sections, in, including mortal cortex and caudate nucleus and superior frontal gyrus. And using this uh, ROI, uh, this algorithm detects uh, each type of pathology like this, and uh, result is like this. It's very too small, but uh, here, for example, here, coded nucleus, uh, this is the result of the quantification of each type of pathology. And this is from motor cortex, and this is from superior frontal gyrus. And using this tabulated data, random forest classifier can classify four type of these. Alzheimer's disease, CBD, PICS disease, and PSP. In that paper, uh, we used 120 cases of these diseases, and the final diagnostic accuracy was 95%. So using the quantifi quantified data from three brain regions, uh, good enough to sufficiently differentiate for tau pathies. So our previous models worked pretty accurate. It's very good but both models were based on supervised learning. So human pathologists need to prepare labeled datasets. As I mentioned, labeling dataset is very painful and tedious task. So, and actually collecting labeled dataset in medical images is a bottleneck to develop machine learning model in the medical field. And for example, the previous model, this one, uh, to collect the dataset, I reviewed and annotate more than 2,500 images. It's a very, very painful task. And this might be subject to mislabeling. For example, uh, sometimes I encountered a very atypical inclusion, and I think it's a good example. It's not a very good example of tufted astrocyte, for example. So it may be, uh, it, there is a risk of mislabeling. So to overcome these limitations, we aim to utilize a different approach, so-called weekly supervised learning. 
This algorithm allowed us to train the model using less precisely leveled data at the slider level rather than the mo more granular tile level. So this is an example. So as you can see here, uh, this is a whole slide image from the AD patient. And uh, the old tissues are split into small tiles like this, and all tiles are labeled as AD. So we don't have to see and level each tile. So all tiles are AD. It's a very rough approach. And some tiles are very variable for running, but some may not. But uh, the algorithm use all of the tiles at the, under the one uh, leveling. And this, this approach is significantly reduce the leveling button, of course. So the aim of the study was to develop a pipeline for diagnosing Alzheimer's disease and telepathies using weekly supervised learning. And this approach allows us to use whole slide images and slide level leveling. So it can significantly reduce the leveling burden and the risk of misleveling. So in this study, we analyzed a total of 121 cases of six categories. So five telepathies and one non telepathy control. So AD, CBD, PIX disease, PSP, and GGT. And as shown here, we obtained three sections from each case which are processed for type image chemistry and subsequently scanned to generate digital whole site images. The so section A includes uh, motor cortex, section B includes superior frontal gyrus and cingulate gyrus, and six, section C is uh, including caudate nucleus and epitamen. And all tissues were split into small tiles and all tiles were labeled as one diagnosis. And we did a five-fold cross-validation. So 80% of cases for, were used for training and 20% 20 20 of cases were used for testing. So here are the results. The VEST model achieved the accuracy of 87% in section B and the combined data sets. So we also used all section A, B, C at one data set and this up, achieved 84% of diagnostic accuracy. And uh, here is a representative uh, confusion matrix of combined data set. So for example, uh, here, so in CBD, so in this combined data set, there are 30 cases of CBD and 28 out of 30 cases were correctly diagnosed as CBD. One case was misdiagnosed as AD and one case was misdiagnosed as PSP. And we also used an attention-based interpretation analysis to understand the morphologic features contributing to the diagnosis. And here are the representative tau imagery tau images. And this is a heat map of attention heat map. And this is the result of the prediction value in AD and CBD. So in AD, tau pathology was most apparent in the gray matter. And the model confidently diagnosed this case as AD, so almost 99%. For CBD, tau lesions were almost equally uh, distributed in the gray and white matter, and the model diagnosed as CBD with high confidence, like 95%. And uh, heat map shows that high, highest attention in the deep layer of the gray matter in AD, and in CBD, uh, high attention in white matter, mostly in the white matter. We further investigate the morphologic features associated with high attention values, to do this, we sorted all tiles based on their attention values and the top tiles are displayed here. We utilized grad cam to visualize attention values within the each tile, which helped us interpret the structures contributing to high attention. So for example, in AD patients, the top tile contained numerous tau positive threads and uh, here, neurofibrillary tango. And grad cam reviewed highest attention in the neurofibrillary tango. For CBD cases, the top tile featured numerous tau positive threads in the white matter, and grad cam highlights high attention in this uh, area, so threads. And in GGT, so this IHC shows uh, GOI, globular oligodendroglial inclusions and uh, globular astrostic inclusions, and grad cam also 
uh, focuses these uh, characteristic features, characteristic pathology, and in PICS disease, uh, PICD like neuronal inclusion has highest attention. And in PSP, uh, cold body in the white water shows the highest attention in the grad cam. So, oh, and this is an example of, it's a very latest uh, case report we published, and this is an example of the application of our uh, CLAM algorithm. So, you believe or not, these all images are from one patient. So, this A to D shows tufted astrocytes, and E to H shows astrocytic plaque, and 4R tau shows tufted astrocytes and astrocytic plaque, and Garia staining shows tufted astrocytes and astrocytic plaque. And we were struggling the diagnosis of this patient. So this is a 75-year-old woman, Richardson syndrome, and family history with PSP. And it shows tufted astrocytes and astrocytic plaque in one brain. And we used our CLAM model. And this model diagnosed PSP in the section A and B, so motor cortex and superfrontal gyrus. And in section C, it's CBD. So it, the diagnosis was depending on the brain region. And actually, this supports our idea of pathological diagnosis that this patient has a mixed feature of this case, PSP and CBD. So conclusions, our diagnostic pipeline, uh, we developed a diagnostic pipeline using CLAM on whole cell images of tau imaging to diagnose five different typuses with high accuracy. This tool is designed to assist, not replace human pathologists in, diagnostic, di in diagnosing typopathies. Our findings demonstrate the feasibility of CLAM for classification tasks on whole site images, and it, it is encouraging further research, especially in clinical pathological correlation studies. Okay, thank you for listening. And this study was done by collaboration of Neuropathology Lab at Mayo and AI Department at Mayo Clinic. Thank you. All right, can everyone see my slides? Yep. Fantastic. So I think the previous two presenters really set the stage up really well for me here. So my research philosophy as a experimental neuropathologist, as you can see, a PhD scientist, now an MD, is trying to gather these end of phenotypes from these slides that we can use in correlative studies, whether that be to predict something that was happening anti-mortem or to use them in large genome-wide association studies. We have the philosophy that if we have these very carefully crafted endophenotypes, even if we have smaller genome-wide studies that we could use them to find risk loci um, that later we can hunt down as potentially a therapeutic target. But before we get to that point, we like to first look at whether we can predict um, cognitive impairment or some clinical feature to give us kind of um, some reassurance that if we move forward into the genetics, which can be expensive, that it will uh, lead to something potentially meaningful. So also in that same vein, you heard in the beginning doing the positive pixel counting, which we've also done as well as potential uh, clinical correlative predictors. And we found that it, it worked fairly well, but one of the issues that we had was when there was comorbid pathologies, uh, it struggled to be significant to predict that. And so um, to give a little background uh, before I get into this talk, as some others have kind of alluded to, it's very clear that AI and artificial intelligence and machine learning is being used more and more um, you know, in the research field, especially um, in medicine. And, and Dr. Koga showed you a great slide of specifically what was happening in neuropathology, but if you just look across medical research in general, this is certainly a field that is um, taking off. So um, just kind of like a, a little background of what we were thinking here. Um, so, and what's going on with machine learning for those that aren't as familiar. So most machine learning methods incorporate some sort of central algorithm that processes each instance's feature um, to yield an output for that instance. 
Uh, and that's what you're seeing here in this schematic. So the output might be continuous value in a regression method or a category or class in a classification method. The algorithm might implement a simple or complex equation. It might resent, represent multiple sequential or network processing steps as in a decision tree or neural network, which you're going to see here in this paper that I have currently published this uh, previous year. Um, so basically, during the learning, the output of the algorithm is progressively modified based on the input data. And the learning process referred to as training doesn't modify the programming code at all of the algorithm in most forms of machine learning. Instead, the algorithm contains parameters, some kind called weights and bias values, um, that are modified during the training to change its output. The algorithm, together with its modified parameters, is termed the model. And the training process is sometimes called building or training the model. So that's what you saw uh, Dr. Koga discuss previously. So a typical model development contains the algorithm embedded in the management software and trains the model by feeding the instance data to it, evaluating the accuracy of its output and modifying it, the parameters to improve the accuracy. Um, so I'm going to talk previously about the, mo or the model that we used in the paper here. Um, but before I do that, I always like to show uh, this particular slide. You know, we can distinguish the Muffin or um, Chihuahua pretty easily, but uh, it wasn't as easy for an AI to do this until recently when we had better computers, more powerful GPUs. I know here at Mount Sinai, we're constantly upgrading our high-performance computing cluster, which we've named Minerva. Um, so we have a lot of um, GPUs that, that can be harnessed and leveraged, and we're constantly adding more. Um, so the most advanced AI, which I'm talking here, the most advanced for now, is deep learning. And this has become more commonly used for speech recognition, chat GPT, and all the buzzwords that we see uh, in the mainstream media right now. So what was the backstory to this paper? So in 2019, um, with some collaborators here at the Center for Computational Systems Pathology at Mount Sinai, uh, this is um, um, two guys, Jack Zenith and Jerry Fernandez, uh, now work for a company called Precise um, MD. Um, we developed and annotated very painstakingly, as Dr. Toga, uh, Koga said, 3,177 patches of neurofibrillary tangles. And so to do this, we had to outline each one by hand. Uh, an expert neuropathologist did this over many months uh, to get these the patches that you see in black. Um, this was extremely cumbersome and time consuming. Um, and that's why we've moved to multiple instance learning models uh, that you just saw from uh, Dr. Koga. But um, we still like these types of fully supervised models. And uh, we used a, a pre-trained ResNet 50 model to develop our algorithm or train the weights and biases. And when I say pre-trained, it had already learned off of features, um, images that had been collected across the internet uh, to make the training process run um, more easy. And so some of the downsides to what we trained on is it represents, or it's able to identify neurofibrillary tangles but it, it can't differentiate the later stage ghost tangles or the early um, pre-tangles uh, or the intercellular tangles. It just knows whether it's tangle, yes, no. So that's something that we're working on now to try to get tangled maturity metrics into the model. But at the time, you know, in 2018, when we I trained this model and, you know, got these great uh, scores, you see the recall, the precision and F1 score down. The precision quantifies the number of positive class predictions that actually belong to the positive class. And recall quantifies the number of positive class predictions made out of the positive examples in the data set. Um, so these numbers are very important. And the F1 score is the harmonic mean of the precision recall. And on a research end, we felt that they were quite high. You know, on a, a clinical or diagnostic end, you always want it to be perfect, right? But we felt that you know this was working pretty well, and um, we then wanted to move forward with this model and apply it to some of the data sets that we had been creating. So um, during my postdoctoral work, I spent a lot of time collecting individuals um, that had a neuropathological diagnosis of primary age-related tauopathy. And so tauopathies have already been introduced to you by the two previous speakers. 
But I want to point out here what was interesting is that these people had very little or low amyloid, and they had some sort of tau burden in the medial temporal lobe or hippocampus. And so we had stained uh, all the hippocampuses on the same auto stainer that again was brought up earlier, the, um, the uh, Leica systems. This can do 30 slides. It's not done by hand uh, using AT8 at the same concentration. And we were able to generate this, this very large uh, data set, um, which we also had some metric of cognitive impairment. So most of the people in this data set um, went to autopsy and they were not followed longitudinally. So we don't have really precise means of cognitive impairment. So we just had to collapse it into a bi binary variable of cognitive impairment, yes, no. So this is kind of the overview of the cohort that we're um, working with here. So we have our trained model that can represent the tangle. And now we're applying that model to this new cohort that it's never seen. So the cohort is 706 individuals, 344 of them uh, were cognitively impaired, 362 uh, were not cognitively impaired. You can see the ages of death were pretty similar between these two groups. Uh, they followed a range of BRAC stage, um, some of them having, I know it's kind of confusing with the BRAC stage of zero, some of them still have some sort of uh, tangle or uh, thread pathology. Um, as well up to BRAC5. Um, and for this particular data set, we also included people with no uh, neuritic plaques, as you can see by the CRAD score, or mild neuritic plaques. And I point this out because the previous study that we had done, which was using positive pixels, when we were using this larger data set that included the CRAD1 scores, we weren't really getting uh, reliable diagnostic predictions of anti-mortem clinical cognitive impairment. So for this study, we're now including them to see if the AI can do better than what we were doing before with the positive pixel quantification. And also in the bottom, I'm showing some genetic data where uh, ongoing work is going uh, on right now to continue to genotype these people to use these measurements that we've made in uh, genome-wide association studies. So this was a very focused study because as I had mentioned earlier, and I apologize for this image being blurry. Um, we were focused on people with uh, tau pathology in the medial temporal lobe. So what we had done using uh, the Aperio um, system is annotated roughly, as you can see in blue, what we're referring to as the hippocampus proper. Um, this includes cornomonas one through four, um, as well as the dentate gyrus and some rough estimation of the entorhinal cortex that you see in the bottom of red. So we had annotated these two regions, and then we applied the classifier that we developed in 2018 to go ahead and count the number of neurofibrillary tangles in these regions. And so these were the results of the study that we were pretty encouraged by. So it wasn't perfect, right? So we needed to do a few things to uh, feel confident in what we were doing. So if you look at the bottom at first, we didn't adjust for age, which wouldn't make a whole lot of sense because this is an age-related tauopathy. So age is an extremely confounding variable. But nonetheless, when you don't adjust for age, just using the BRAC stage, this is this conventional approach of staging the tangles that you see in the brain, starting in the medial temporal lobe and, and moving out to the uh, more cortical regions. Uh, there is no significant predictor of um, cognitive impairment if you just use that score. Using the unadjusted age AI detected neurofibrillary tangle densities in the entorhinal cortex, the hippocampus, and then what we're referring to as the combined, which is the sum of both sections, you're always seeing a significant predictor of cognitive impairment. So then going back and adjusting for age, brackets better, but it, it's not um, significant at that point. But if you go to our AI detected um, density in the entorhinal region, you do get, um, although nominal, um, a significant difference in the prediction of um, cognitive impairment, which you're also seeing in the, the graph here. Not unexpectedly in the hippocampus, um, you're not getting that significant predictor. And that might be due to the fact that we're not breaking these up into the hippocampal subfields. And so to accomplish that, we are working on an AI that might be able to figure that out, but it's very difficult 
uh, to develop these AIs to segment things, but we think we might have a way to get over that. And then again, in the combined region, you do see a significant, although nominal, ability to predict anti-mortem cognitive impairment using this uh, classifier. So then at the time, we wanted to go kind of one step further. Uh, we thought maybe the, the clustering or density of the tangles could also help in predicting um, cognitive impairment. And so you see in the, in the, the segment model produces this heat map um, that just been overlaid very similar to the heat maps you saw earlier, except this is using the AI algorithm of how it, uh, predictive it thinks that there is a tangle there. And then if you just apply a simple graph theory um, network to see basically how close the tangles are to one another, can this predict cognitive impairment? Uh, and in fact, it did here. And the question might be, why would this be uh, important? Well, there's other tauopathies, in, including chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which you're seeing in this hemistain section on the side, uh, courtesy of Dr. Ann McKee at Boston University. This is a very patchy tauopathy. So maybe using this approach of how close the tangles are to one another uh, could be kind of interesting uh, in trying to predict cognitive impairment in, in someone with CTE. So it's just another kind of application of our model. Um, so I'm just gonna end by kind of going over some of the conclusions. We felt that these AI-based uh, counting of individual tangles across the medial temporal lobe was the strongest predictor of cognitive impairment when we adjusted for age, which made sense because the cohort that we were looking at was an age-related tauopathy. And despite also including peak part or um, primary age-related tauopathy possible subjects, these are people that did have some neuritic plaques, uh, the AI-based measures were still able to accurately predict cognitive impairment. So they were included in this group. And uh, we felt that encouraging that it wasn't um, necessarily destroying our signal. And then I also introduced some novel graph theory, um, spatial clustering modeling that was also able to predict cognitive status. So, you know, again, this is tedious and time consuming to make these training data sets. Um, so the other two uh, presenters showed some uh, more efficient ways uh, to use different methods of digital pathology to assist in clinical diagnostics and research. But, um, you know, I guess this shows the utility of using a model like that. So I'm just going to go ahead and leave it to um, my thank you slide and my, and my funding sources here. There's a lot of people on the team, um, medical residents, graduate students, uh, other institutions, including UT Southwestern and our own brain bank core that really have allowed us to have these large digitized images to do this type of research. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there. And I guess we'll probably move to Q&A. Thank you all for your great presentations. And we have about 10 minutes. Um, just, I know it's 10 minutes, right? But it's a lot of great information. So there's already been some uh, questions in the chat. Um, so thank you very much. So CLAM was mentioned. And yes, that is open access. Um, so we put the link there to the GitHub uh, repository there. And then um, there was another question of also if the data was balanced for each class of diagnosis, if not, what was your strategy to make the data balanced? And Dr. Koga has answered that question because um, I know we have 10, but we can open it up. Um, and please put your questions in the Q&A um, if that is possible for you. I will add, yes, CLAM is open and it's pretty easy to use. The documentation is really good. And um, I would encourage people to download it and apply it to any data sets they might have. Well, and speaking of that, just to get the ball rolling, to try to promote open access science, you guys mentioned some of these data sets that you created. Are they accessible? Do you plan to have them accessible and even your code? Um, maybe so I think start biggest... with Dr. Coughlin, if you, if you want to answer that question, no. and then each of you can answer. Yeah, I think, it, I think we're largely moving in that direction anyway, and certainly there's a large impetus uh, to move in that direction on a, you know, NIH level, as far as some of their initiatives go as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of our things are published pretty widely, and we're happy to share. I mean, I, I like using QPath these days, because it's free, and it's open source as well, anyway. Um, not to mention, it's sort of programmable on the back end for some more customizable features for people who have that type of skill set. Um, but yeah, I think we are trying to be collaborative because that is one of the strengths ultimately. And it's going to be very necessary for digital pathology work to 
to develop is so that we can collaborate and get a, get outside of our own institutional silos. So we develop tools that are going to cut across all of our different centers anyway, so we can ask bigger questions better. <laughs> So those are the tools, but I'm referring specifically to the data sets that you guys use, because the whole thing with science is reproducibility, right? So tools is one thing, but what about the data sets and, and what are your plans for that? So what about you, Dr. Koga? You presented some great works. Thank you for asking. Yes, of course, I want to make our data sets publicly open access, but the issue is where we can put, I mean, the repository. So in my previous work, I used Zenodo. It's a publicly accessible kind of data repository, but I think it's up to 50 gigabyte. If I want to put larger size data set, I cannot use Zenodo. So, and I'm struggling to find the best place to post our data set. So I want to do, but the practical pro problem is where we can put the data set. What about you, Dr. Farrell? So I want to point out and add on to that two kind of revolutionary things that happened in the field of cancer digital images. The NIH had an instant uh, uh, push to make the TGCA or this, I don't know if I'm getting the name correct, but there is this large data set or uh, repository that they can put their images in. And for all of the genetic data, you know, we're required now to put them into the geo or the hub. But as far as I know, that doesn't exist for neuropath data in terms of an NIH-funded initiative. I believe that it, it's going to come around in the next year or two, at least I hope it will, and I'm happy to deposit all of my data there. But just like Dr. Koga said, I, I don't have the funding to host a server to make it available. I do know that the Mount Sinai ADRC um, is now releasing all of their images uh, on a, a website. Uh, called uh, Charcot. Uh, I don't have the link in front of me, but uh, Dr. Can... Heratunian is on the line, so I don't know if you can maybe ask a question, but put that in the chat. A nice promotion for for that that repository. I think that is a is a great resource for people, you know, that want to start playing around with some of these algorithms or you know develop potential collaborations. Um, but I think the future in the future there'll be more ways to to get this type of data for now, I've been mailing hard drives around with it and that's just inefficient. Well, another thing, and, and Dr. Koga, you mentioned about the limitations is you can put the tiled images. Sometimes you can't put the whole slide images because those are big, but you can put your little digestible chunks on, on these wonderful repositories. Yeah, I think, yeah, actually I prefer depositing uh, whole slide images. So other investigator can also use it as they want to do so but as you know whole side image is very huge data so it's about one gigabyte or two gigabyte so yeah it's really difficult to find the best place to put yeah so any other questions comments we still have about six minutes left again appreciate everybody stopping by um on a monday morning especially after um we just had the American Association of Neuropathologists annual meeting, which I see a lot of people on the line that attended that. So I really appreciate, especially probably after a lot of you guys have traveled. I have a couple of questions for, I guess, Dr. Koga at first, if, if there's, and unless there's other ones from the attendees. So I was curious for Dr. Koga, what were some of the more common errors that your machine learning classification to have trouble say with like, astrocytic plaques versus neuritic plaques? Like what were the things that it tended to get wrong? Oh, so what, what do you mean? So yeah, so my model sometimes mixed up both uh, neuritic plaques and astrocytic plaques actually. And this is a kind of limitation. And, and in the reality, so one patient has both pathologies, so CBD with some AD pathology. So in this case, uh, it is extremely difficult to accurately distinguish between astrocytic plaques and neurotic plaques. And this difficulty is not for machine, but also for pathologist or the person who make a data set. So as I mentioned, I sometimes encountered equivocal uh, pathology. So uh, it was a hard time to assign 
neurotic plaques or osteotic plaques. For this reason, uh, in the, my previous study, uh, I used relatively pure CBD to avoid the contamination of neurotic plaque and pure PSP to avoid the contamination of AD. So that's why I also used uh, weekly supervised learning to avoid this kind of mislabeling. But yeah, so in reality, uh, my uh, model sometimes uh, make misdiagnosis between astrostic plaques and neurotic plaques. And it especially happens in the patient who has both coexistence pathology. And you brought up a, a question that kind of was leading into what my second question was going to be anyway, is that, you know, since copathology is really the rule and not the exception in these cases anyway, yeah. and how difficult it can be sometimes for even expert neuropathologists to determine, say, Brock Tau staging in the setting of a CBD case, do you feel like there might be a role for your machine learning algorithm and sort of teasing that apart so we can like have an easier time to assess co-pathologies um, using this as an augmentary tool to help uh, mm -hmm. help our experts. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of the tau co-pathology, so if so if, if we use a CLAM and we uh, assigned slide level diagnosis like AD plus CBD or AD plus PSP, I think uh, we can address this issue. So we can increase the number of categories, uh, including this combination of copathology, but it's a bit difficult because there are too many combinations like AD plus AGD plus PSP or something like that. But technically speaking, it is doable. And considering other types of copathology like Lewy body disease or TDP43, of course we need to use different immunohistochemistry. So yeah, but speaking of tau, Tau has very variety, different variety of copathology, and the combination will be yeah high number. So it's a bit difficult to cover all of the combination of copathology, but technically doable. Great. And then maybe a question for Dr. Farrell, since I don't see any other ones coming in the Q and A. Um, the the spatial metric that you were presented at the end is, is kind of interesting and I haven't seen a lot of that. And, and I, I definitely take your point that that seems like it would be most applicable to, to CTE where you get you know patchy trauma related inclusions and things like that. But have you played with it in other like disease states as like a marker of like clinical pathologic correlation to see if like, if tangle or feature density in this sort of graph theory like correlates with any other like anti-mortem metrics like in Alzheimer's or in, um, I don't know, other things. Yeah, that's a great point. We're somewhat limited in the data sets that we have to apply it to other things. We are currently working with Boston University to get more digitized images of CTE first off to see if, you know, it will work in that context before we move forward. I also think if we're able to develop um, more classifiers for other pathologies, uh, maybe that will also play a great role in figuring out what's related to some antemortem features. But what we did actually do with it is we used the CLAM that was discussed earlier, but modified it to use a graph theory metric that, you know, uh, Dr. Koga showed it, it breaks it down into the patches, right? But then if we let each patch that's next to each other kind of influence what that patch is predicting, using a basic graph theory model of the four or five patches surrounding the one patch, we saw that the CLAM model uh, got better uh, and we use that to predict actually age. So the graph theory is something we're toying around with, um, using it, as you just said, in maybe other pathologies, other contexts, but also in just developing our class or our machine learning models themselves, just using it as an extra step to make it uh, be even better at its predictions. And with that, we're pretty much at the hour. So big thank you specifically to NAC too. I, I, I do apologize, didn't mention that. So National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center, we have Hannah Rosenteeter on and thank you for co helping coordinate this. And thank you to all of our speakers. This was great.
And again, um, this is Digital Pathology Working Group, ADRC stuff. So if you have anything that you guys want to present for those rest of the persons online, let us know, right? We're trying to be inclusive and promote these wonderful um, concepts of digital pathology and machine learning. So with that, everybody have a great week. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody.